describes this new Israeli union as a delicate embroidery of ethnicities, faiths, tribes, and ideas. So, can it survive? Can it go? Yeah. Robin, that is the question that a lot of Israelis are asking themselves today. And I would say primarily the two most important in this government, Naftali Bennett, who is the new prime minister, as well as Yari Lapid, who was the architect of this government and will serve as the alternate prime minister as well as the foreign minister, right? They, they are hoping it will survive. Bennett wants to keep his two-year term in place. He wants to uh, serve it out so he can maybe regain some political allies and some votes if there's a future election. And Lapid, of course, in 2023, wants to move into the prime minister's office. That's also been his dream is to serve as Israel's prime minister. And of course, they want to keep Netanyahu in the opposition. They don't want to give him an opportunity for this government to fall apart and for him to be able to sweep back in, pick up the pieces and, and sail to election victory. So I think that they want it to stick together and the glue that will keep it together is the fact that Netanyahu is not leaving, right? He's staying in the opposition. He wants to stay in the Knesset as a parliamentarian. And I think as long as he's out there, that will be what will keep these people to keep their government together. And hopefully at the same time, they'll be able to work for the country, which desperately needs a government. So Naftali Bennett, what is going to be his first order of business? And how difficult is it going to be for him, from his political point of view, from his political ideology, his spot on that spectrum, uh, to hold together and compromise with the very people he is in government with? It's going to be very hard, right? This is a fractured government from the beginning. Usually governments fall apart as they move forward, but this government already from the get-go is ideologically splintered. You have the right, the left, the center. You have for the first time in Israeli history the participation in a coalition government of an Arab Islamist party, right? How all of this stays together is going to be complicated because there will be crises, right? There will be, God forbid, another Gaza conflict. How do they respond? There will be legislation that will be too progressive for Bennett or too conservative for the left flank of that government. So how do all of these different pieces keep it together? But I think that if they keep their eyes on the goal, which is the fact that for nearly three years, the Israeli people have not had a functioning government. For over three years, they haven't had a state budget. There are government ministries that are literally starving for funds to be able to provide the services they need to to the Israeli people. So all of this together gives them enough of a reason to keep it together. His first objective, I think, is going to be pass a state budget, and most important, Robin, just create some quiet, right? Israelis in my newspaper included in the Jerusalem Post, we've been reporting on the front page of our paper for almost three years now politics, right? Israelis need some quiet. They need to see a government that's just working, that's getting to work, that's not talking so much, that's not making a lot of noise, that is just working for the people. They just uh, want to take a deep breath in many ways. Now, what is interesting, you mentioned, we've talked about Naftali Bennett, uh, you mentioned the EIA Lapid, and we heard that opposition heckling in the Knesset. Lapid actually cancelled his speech because of it, but he did stand up to apologise for cancelling his speech, but he apologised to his mother, and he said this. Respected Knesset, I will not deliver the speech I intended to give. I came here for one reason. I want to apologize to my mother. My mother is 86, and it's not easy for us to ask her to come to Jerusalem. We did it because I assumed that you will succeed in overcoming yourselves and be statesmanlike in this moment, so that she will see how administration changes. When she was born, the state of Israel didn't exist. Tel Aviv was a town of 30,000 people. We didn't have a parliament, and I wanted her to be proud in the Israeli democratic process. Instead of that, she and every other Israeli citizen are ashamed of you and are also reminded why it's time to replace you. Thank you very much. He didn't need to say his speech, did he? That was it. Uh, it was all he needed to say. And it was quite a takedown there of Mr. Netanyahu and his allies, all the while invoking, evoking his mother. Uh, how deft has Mr. Lapid been and how much more deft will he have to be to also hold this coalition together that he has been the architect of? Lapid is very savvy, and he gets the media. He's a longtime veteran journalist, and he's been now in politics for just over 10 years. He knew exactly what he was doing yesterday, and he got his message across very well and very smartly. Lapid was the architect, right? He has 17 seats in this coalition. Bennett, on the other hand, who will serve first as prime minister, has only seven, and he already had one defector. So really, he came to the table with only six seats. But still, Lapid understood that if he doesn't have Bennett, 
Bennett holds the keys. He's the one who can either make or break this government. So he had to offer him the rotation. And putting his ego aside and basically saying, I'm willing to serve in the second time as prime minister is something that Israelis are not used to seeing, right? They're not used to seeing a politician do something like that. And that's because they've gotten so used to Netanyahu, who for 12 years has ruled over Israel with a strong fist. He hasn't ever given in to his political rivals. He's never ceded power. He's always knocked off the heads or chopped off the heads of anyone who came too close to presenting a potential competitor or competition to him. And, and that's what basically coalesced into this coalition that brought him down. I think what you saw yesterday, Robin, in the Knesset, with that heckling really was shameful for the state of Israel. That's not how the Israeli parliament is used to conducting itself. And it, and it shows to an extent what happens when someone is in power for too long. It shows why there is an importance for transition of power, for term limits. And hopefully that's something that this government will do. It's in its coalition agreement is to pass a bill for term limits, either eight years or two terms as prime minister. Mm -hmm. That's something that we need like many democracies in the world. What does this mean? We've been talking about the domestic implications of this. What does this mean from, from a foreign policy perspective and particularly from, say, D.C.'s perspective? The Biden administration was very quick to congratulate this government. How will they cooperate, particularly on, on issues like Iran, for example, or not? Cooperate. Well, it was interesting, Robin, how Biden called Naftali Bennett within two hours of the yes. swearing in of the coalition. Very the quick. And him becoming prime minister. If you recall, back when uh, Biden took office in January, it took nearly, I think it was three or four weeks until him and Prime Minister Netanyahu finally spoke. Right. But it was clear that the administration and the Democratic Party as a whole were not happy with Netanyahu. They clearly remembered that speech in 2015 that he gave opposing President Obama at the time and against the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA. So it was interesting to see how quickly they were willing to embrace a new leader, even though he does come from the right. But I think it's part of the Biden administration's approach to and strategy to show Israelis they don't have a problem with Israel. Their problem was with Netanyahu, and they want to try to work with Bennett, right? And, and Bennett will have to stand strong if he wants to continue to oppose this nuclear deal. He said in his speech that he's against the nuclear deal, basically following in the footsteps of Netanyahu, but it will be difficult for him to stand up to the administration. Israeli-U.S. ties are of an extreme importance for the Jewish state of Israel, right? They're one of the pillars, or strategic pillars upon which mm -hmm. Israel derives its deterrence and its strategic power and, and is able to project power throughout the Middle East, whether it's military aid, the supply of advanced weapons and fighter aircraft, et cetera. So Israel and under Bennett will have to maneuver very carefully to not blow up those relations, but at the same time to try to get the administration in Washington to listen to Israeli concerns when it comes to the nuclear negotiations that are going on in Vienna as we speak. Yaakov Katz, uh, great to speak to you. Thanks so much for joining us this Thank hour you. live in Jerusalem.